Chapter Five of Guy Fawkes, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. sixteen o five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Guy Fawkes, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. sixteen o five by thomas lathbury chapter five the proceedings of the conspirators on the discovery of the plot their capture at hole beach the meeting of parliament it will now be necessary to look back a little on the movements of the other conspirators fox remained to fire the train and was secured as is detailed in the last chapter on tuesday morning november fifth as early as five o'clock one of the wrights called on thomas winter assuring him that the whole plot was discovered wright stated that a nobleman had called on lord monteagle bidding him rise to accompany him to the earl of northumberland's where it was probably expected that percy would be found this was only an hour after the return of the searching party to whitehall some of the conspirators were on the watch in various parts of the town and wright chanced to obtain the important information which he communicated to winter he heard the nobleman who called up lord monteagle say the matter is discovered at winter's request wright went back to essex gate to learn something further in a short space he returned adding all is lost he found a man on horseback at essex door who immediately rode at full gallop up fleet street winter was conscious that they were seeking for percy and he requested wright to make him acquainted with all that had taken place in order that he might effect his escape winter then quitted his lodging being determined to ascertain the worst he went first to the court gates which were so guarded that no one could enter he proceeded onward toward the parliament house but was prevented from passing by the guard which was posted in king street as he came back he heard a person in the street observe to another that a treason was just discovered in which the king and the lords were to have been blown up by gunpowder winter was now convinced that all was discovered and therefore he rode off into the country the two wrights appear to have quitted london at the same time catesby the leader of the conspirators had left london the preceding evening in order that he might prepare to execute their project relative to the princess elizabeth as soon as the blow should be struck percy also had departed from london that morning as early as four o'clock probably from having received some information respecting the discovery they made the best of their way into warwickshire where they had previously agreed to meet london was all in commotion as the day dawned the streets were thronged with spectators all eagerly inquiring what had taken place during the night it was soon ascertained that a conspiracy had been providentially discovered and that one of the traitors was already in custody the satisfaction of the people was great at the intelligence that no danger now existed and that the king and the parliament were safe fox was kept strictly guarded and in a few days made a confession of the principal circumstances of the conspiracy the conspirators who had quitted london previous to the fifth of november proceeded to the place of meeting in warwickshire on wednesday morning grant and certain others seized upon some horses which had been placed under the care of a riding master these horses were to be used at the hunting match appointed by digby their object was to assemble large numbers of people under the pretence of hunting and then seize upon the princess elizabeth having the princess in their possession they hoped to be able to succeed in effecting a complete change in the government of the country had the plot succeeded in london most of the papists would have joined them on wednesday evening the conspirators who resided in the country as well as those who had quitted london before the discovery met at sir everard digby's according to their previous arrangement 
it was now known that the plot was discovered for those who had left london on tuesday morning brought with them the intelligence the question now agitated related to their future movements and it was determined to make an attempt at open rebellion this attempt shows the desperate character of the men for they could not reasonably indulge in the expectation of success they accordingly mustered as many forces as they were able intending to await the issue of an encounter with the civil power and hoping amid the confusion consequent upon the discovery of the treason to induce many members of the church of rome to join them in one of the letters of sir everard digby referred to in a subsequent page a clear and succinct account of their intended movements is given if the design had taken place there could have been no doubt of other success for that night before any other could have brought the news we should have known it by mr catesby who should have proclaimed the heir apparent at charing cross as he came out of town to which purpose there was a proclamation drawn if the duke had not been in the house then there was a certain way laid for the possessing him but in regard of the assurance they should have been there therefore the greatest of our business stood in the possessing the lady elizabeth who lying within eight miles of dunchurch we would have easily surprised before the knowledge of any doubt this was the cause of my being there they mustered to the number of eighty persons only from warwickshire they passed to the borders of staffordshire sir richard verney the high sheriff of warwickshire pursued them as they rambled through the country they seized upon such arms and ammunition as fell in their way on friday the eighth of november the conspirators reached the house of stephen littleton at holbeach in staffordshire the sheriff of worcestershire sent a trumpeter commanding them to surrender thinking they were merely guilty of an ordinary riot for he had not yet heard of the conspiracy in those days intelligence was not so rapidly communicated from one part of the country to another as in modern times the discovery took place on tuesday morning very early and the assemblage at littleton's house was on the friday after and yet the sheriff of worcestershire had received no information respecting the discovery of the plot the traitors however were not aware that the sheriff was ignorant of their proceedings in london on the contrary they imagined that he was sent after them by a special order from the court they prepared therefore to defend themselves being resolved to sell their lives as dearly as possible the sheriff promised to intercede with his majesty in their favour on the condition of their surrendering themselves being unacquainted with their treason several proclamations had been sent into the country after the conspirators in which the necessity of preserving percy alive was strongly urged but in those days a hundred miles were not soon travelled over it is stated by contemporary authorities that the roads were very bad at the time while another reason assigned for the slow travelling of the messengers who had carried the proclamations is the shortness of the days it appears that travelling by night at that time was never contemplated thus on the third day after the discovery of the treason the day on which the conspirators met at holbeach the authorities in the counties in which the traitors were assembled had received no tidings even of the existence of a plot while they were occupied in making their preparations in the house a spark of fire dropped on about two pounds of gunpowder which had been laid on a plate near the chimney for the purpose of being dried one of the party chanced to throw a log of wood on the fire this raised the sparks one of which fell on the powder causing an explosion by which the roof of the house was blown off and the persons of catesby rockwood and grant were blackened and scorched it was remarkable that a bag of gunpowder of considerable size which was lying in the room at the time of the explosion was blown into the courtyard without being ignited or none of the conspirators could have survived and thus the whole of the plot would have been for ever enveloped in mystery catesby rookwood and grant were partly disabled by the explosion so bearing in their bodies says fuller not stigmata 
the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the print of their own impieties. As the house had caught fire, it was deemed necessary to open the doors and attempt to escape. But when the bars of the outer gates were removed to permit the conspirators to rush forth, the sheriff's men rushed in, so that escape was impossible. The battle now raged in the courtyard of the house with great violence. Catesby and Percy placed themselves back to back and fought, though the former had been partly disabled by the explosion with desperate courage. One of the sheriff's men leveled his piece across a wall, taking deliberate aim at Catesby and Percy, both of whom fell by the same ball. The former dead on the spot, and the latter mortally wounded. Footnote. Never, says Fuller, were two bad men's deaths more generally lamented of all good men only on this account that they lived no longer to be forced to a further discovery of their secret associates End footnote. the two wrights also were slain during the encounter in the court of littleton's house rookwood and one of the winters were wounded and the rest were taken prisoners as soon as possible after the struggle the conspirators were lodged by the sheriff in the county jail in a short space they were removed to london and during the journey and especially as they approached the metropolis the people came in vast crowds to obtain a sight of the men who had concocted and almost executed so desperate a treason every one wished to see the faces of the men whose names and whose deeds were now resounded from one end of the country to the other tresham remained in london during the commotion consequent upon the discovery of the plot he was taken in a short time and lodged in prison robert winter evaded the search that was made for him during a short space but at length was apprehended sir everard digby was also taken the actual conspirators were thirteen in number four were slain in the conflict at holbeach and the rest were all taken soon after the discovery of the plot Tresham confessed in prison his share in the transaction. He died before the day appointed for their trial. Eight of them were brought to trial early in the next year, as will be noticed in a subsequent chapter. On the 9th of November, the Parliament assembled. The King addressed them on the occasion in a lengthened speech in which he dwelt on the proceedings of the traitors and on the policy of the measures which had been enacted against recusants. James took a sort of review of all the dangers to which he had been exposed, alluding especially to the Gowry conspiracy. The speech abounds in good sense, and sensible and judicious remarks are scattered all over its parts. Alluding to the characters of the conspirators, he very wisely observes that there was nothing to induce them to enter into this conspiracy except a mistaken zeal for their religion. He tells the Lords and Commons that as soon as the letter was shown to him, he interpreted certain expressions contrary to the ordinary laws of grammar to refer to some explosion of gunpowder. Having heard the speech from the throne, the Parliament was adjourned until the 21st of the ensuing January. When the discovery of the plot was known on the continent, several of the sovereigns sent to congratulate the King on his escape. In the case of some of these sovereigns, their congratulations were sincere, but in other cases the language of deceit must have been used. The King of Spain and the Pope were among the most forward to congratulate His Majesty, and yet with great inconsistency they sheltered and protected some of those individuals who fled from their own country and were privy to the conspiracy. Osborne assures us, however, that the Pope could not refrain from laughing in the face of Cardinal de Asset when he informed him that the Spanish monarch had sent a special messenger to the English court for that express purpose. Indeed, all these congratulations were hollow and insincere, but they would have been exposed to censure as men and as sovereigns if they had not so far acted the part of hypocrites as to pretend to rejoice at the escape of the english monarch 
that the pope and the king of spain and some other papal sovereigns would have rejoiced at the success of the plot can scarcely be doubted since their subsequent actions as will be noticed in another chapter proved that they favored those who were privy to the conspiracy it can scarcely indeed be doubted that the spanish sovereign and his holiness and perhaps some other sovereigns were acquainted with the designs of the conspirators at all events if they were not aware of the particulars of the plot they knew that some conspiracy was in agitation which was intended to be executed during that winter many of the romanists on the continent knew that some great deed was to be attempted though they did not know the particulars the parliament did not meet on the fifth of november but the following entry stands on the journals of the house of commons under that date this last night the upper house of parliament was searched by sir thomas nevitt and one johnson servant to mr thomas percy was there apprehended who had placed thirty-six barrels of gunpowder in the vault under the house with a purpose to blow up the king and the whole company when they should there assemble afterwards divers other gentlemen were discovered to be of the plot on the twenty first of january the two houses assembled according to the previous arrangement when a committee was formed to consider the laws already in force that tend to the preservation of religion what defects are in the execution of them or what new laws may be thought needful the lord chancellor gave special directions to the clerk to notice the peers who should fail to attend in their places for there was a suspicion that certain roman catholic lords were implicated in the treason some were in consequence imprisoned and fined in the house of commons the same subject was discussed the first day of the session the minds of men indeed could dwell on nothing else nor is it surprising that such was the case for a most horrible plot had been discovered and the traitors were already in prison awaiting the sentence of the law at length a committee was appointed to decide upon some course to be taken against jesuits seminaries and other papal agents the conspirators were tried and convicted at common law as will be related in the next chapter but the parliament seemed anxious to award some new punishment beyond that which was ordinarily inflicted on traitors on such culprits for the purpose of marking their sense of their crime accordingly a committee was appointed in the lords to consider what extraordinary punishments should be inflicted while they were engaged in this business it was reported to the house that it was not convenient to delay longer the trial of the conspirators and therefore the matter was dropped the commons were no less anxious on the subject than the lords the question was debated at some length but at last it was determined that the conspirators should be left to the ordinary courts of justice on the twenty fifth of january however the commons framed and passed a bill which was sent up to the lords entitled an act for appointing a thanksgiving to almighty god every year on the fifth of november when the bill was carried to the lords the messenger stated that the whole body of the commons having entered into consideration of the great blessing of god in the happy preservation of his majesty and the state from the late most dangerous treason intended to have been attempted by the instigation of jesuits seminaries and romish priests had framed and passed the said bill in their house as the first fruits of their labors in this session of parliament which they did very earnestly recommend to their lordships the lords read and passed the bill in three days without even going into committee this act is therefore the first in the printed statutes of the session several bills were passed against recusants and as a protection to the protestant religion on the twenty seventh of may the session was terminated footnote during this session an act was passed by which every one was obliged to take the oath of allegiance a very moderate test says hume since it decided no controverted points between the two religions 
and only engaged the persons who took it to abjure the pope's power of dethroning kings mr hallam's testimony is equally conclusive we cannot wonder what a parliament so narrowly rescued from personal destruction endeavoured to draw the cord still tighter round these dangerous enemies the statute passed on this occasion is by no means more harsh than might be expected End footnote. it may be mentioned that the ceremony of examining the vaults is performed at the commencement of every session whether indeed it has been continued since the destruction of the two houses by fire i am unable to determine but as the cellar must still remain i should imagine that the ceremony is still repeated at all events such was the case prior to the fire the cellar is still designated guy fawkes cellar End of chapter five Chapter 6 of Guy Fawkes, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. 1605. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Oxnard. Guy Fawkes, or A Complete History of the Gunpowder Treason, A.D. 1605. By Thomas Lathbury. Chapter 6. Trial of the Conspirators. The conspirators who had been lodged in prison were frequently examined respecting the plot in which they had been engaged. Fawkes, Thomas Winter, Tresham, and Sir Everard Digby confessed that they were guilty of the treason charged against them, and several of the particulars which I have detailed in the preceding chapters were revealed in these confessions. Catesby and Percy were slain at Holbeach, or some other information respecting the origin of the plot might have been obtained. It is probable, too, that Percy might have been able to give some account of the mysterious letter, for though the conspirators did not suspect him as the writer, yet it is evident that such was the impression on the mind of Lord Monteagle. To this day the subject is involved in mystery. Several conjectures have been formed, but the matter has never been cleared up and it is likely to continue to be involved in mystery until that great day when all secrets shall be unravelled and all difficulties removed tresham as before observed died in prison and was thus spared the ignominy of a public execution the other conspirators robert winter thomas winter guy fawkes john grant ambrose rookwood robert keyes and thomas bates were arraigned and placed at the bar on the 27th of January, 1605-6. to The names of Garnet, Tesmond, and Gerard, all Jesuits, were also specified in the indictment, though none of them were taken. Garnet was subsequently apprehended, but the other two Jesuits evaded the pursuit of the officers of justice altogether. The Jesuits especially charged in the indictment, with persuading the other conspirators to act on the ground that the king was a heretic, and that all heretics were accursed and excommunicated, and that consequently it was lawful, nay, even meritorious, to kill the king for the advancement of the See of Rome. The seven individuals before mentioned are then charged with consenting and with contriving the plot, in conjunction with the Jesuits. It appears to have been arranged by the conspirators not to mention at first anything concerning a change of religion in the event of the success of the plot, and further it was agreed not to avow the treason until they should have acquired sufficient power to secure the completion of their plans when the usual questions were asked they all pleaded not guilty the indictment was opened by sir edward phillips one of the king's sergeants at law this gentleman stated the case to the jury in a speech partly political and partly theological treason was the subject but said he of such horror and monstrous nature that before now the tongue of man never delivered the ear of man never heard the heart of man never conceited nor the malice of hellish or earthly devil ever practised in the course of his speech he further stated that the object of the traitors was 
to deprive the king of his crown, to murder the king, the queen, and the prince, to stir up rebellion and sedition in the kingdom, to bring a miserable destruction upon the subjects, to change, alter, and subvert the religion here established, to ruinate the state of the commonwealth, and to bring in strangers to invade it. That such were their objects, there can be no doubt. Sir Edward Coke, the Attorney-General, followed in a long speech, in which he stated, and then animadverted, on all their proceedings, from the commencement of the plot until its discovery. Surely, said Sir Edward, of these things we may truly say, nunquam antes dies nostrum talia assiderunt, neither hath the eye of man seen, nor the ear of man heard the like things to these. The particulars recorded in the preceding chapters were many of them taken from the confessions of some of the conspirators, and the speech of the Attorney-General was founded in a great measure on the same confessions. Many things indeed could not have been made known in any other way. Several days had been occupied in examining the parties in prison, so that the law officers of the Crown came to the trial amply prepared with materials. In tracing the progress of the treason, Sir Edward remarked, it had three roots, all planted and watered by Jesuits and English Roman Catholics. The first root in England in December and March, the second in Flanders in June, the third in Spain in July. In England it had two branches. One in December was twelve months before the death of the late Queen of Blessed Memory. Another in March wherein she died. He then specifies some of the acts in which Garnet and others were concerned, previous to the accession of James, and which have already been detailed in a preceding chapter. Some important particulars are stated in the speech of Sir Edward Coke respecting the conduct of the government towards the Papists after James's accession. During the reign of Elizabeth, severe measures were never adopted against recusants, as Roman Catholics were then usually designated in Acts of Parliament, until their own conduct, or at all events the conduct of some members of the Church of Rome, rendered it absolutely necessary. The laws respecting which so much has been said by Roman Catholic writers were enacted in self-defence. Had there been no treasons, no such laws would have been devised. But when the members of the Church of Rome planned and endeavoured to execute treasons, and of such a nature that the existing laws did not meet them, it became necessary to devise such methods as should not permit the traitors to escape. The origin, therefore, of the penal laws against the Romanists in the reign of Queen Elizabeth is to be found in their own treasonable practices, and the same remark will apply also to the reign of King James. Indeed, James was disposed to act with all possible leniency. Cruelty was foreign to his nature. Had the Romanists remained quiet, none would have been punished during his reign for their religious principles. Nay, so leniently did James act, even after the discovery of the gunpowder treason, that the Puritans hesitated not to charge him with leaning towards popery. The question relative to the penal laws is clearly and forcibly stated by Sir Edward Coke. Concerning those laws which they so calumniate as unjust, it shall in a few words plainly appear that they were of the greatest, both of moderation and equity, that ever were any. For from the year first Elizabeth unto eleven, all papists came to our church and service without scruple. I myself have seen Cornwallis, Beddingfield, and others at church, so that then, for the space of ten years, they made no conscience nor doubt to communicate with us in prayer. But when once the bull of Pope Pius Quintus was come and published, wherein the queen was accursed and deposed, and her subjects discharged of their obedience and oath, yea, cursed if they did obey her, then did they all forthwith refrain from church, then would they have no more society with us in prayer. So that recusancy in them is not for religion, but in an acknowledgment of the Pope's power, and a plain manifestation what their judgment is concerning the right of the prince in respect of regal power and place. This is the true state of the case respecting the laws against recusants. Sir Edward Coke specifies various treasons during the Queen's reign, and then adds, Anno 23 Elizabeth. After so many years' sufferance, there were laws made against recusants and seditious books. He then alludes to the coming over of the seminary priests, who were Englishmen, educated and ordained on the continent, and who came over into this country for the express purpose of stirring up rebellion, and to bring over the Queen's subjects to the See of Rome. Then, says he, 
27 Elizabeth, a law was made that it should be treason for any, not to be a priest and an Englishman born the queen's natural subject, but for any being so born her subject and made a Romish priest to come into her dominions to infect any her loyal subjects with their treasonable practices, yet so that it concerned only such as were made priests, sithence her majesty came to the crown and not before. Concerning the execution of these laws, he adds, it is to be observed likewise that whereas in the quinquency of Queen Mary they were cruelly put to death about three hundred persons for religion, in all her majesty's time, by the space of forty-four years and upwards, there were for treasonable practices executed in all not thirty priests, nor above five receivers and harbourers of them, and for religion not any one. He proceeds, now against the usurped power of the see of rome we have of former times about thirteen several acts of parliament so that the crown and king of england is in no ways to be drawn under the government of any foreign power whatsoever this is an important point it was no new thing in england to enact laws against the papal jurisdiction the words of king james himself are very strong I do constantly maintain that no man, either in my time or in the late Queen's, ever died here for his conscience. For let him be never so devout a papist, nay, though he profess the same never so constantly, his life is in no danger by the law, if he break not out into some outward act expressly against the words of the law, or plot not some unlawful or dangerous practice or attempt. Priests and popish churchmen only excepted, that receive orders beyond the seas, who for the manifold treasonable practices that they have kindled and plotted in this country are discharged to come home again under pain of treason after their receiving of the said orders abroad and yet without some other guilt in them than bare homecoming have none of them been ever put to death footnote two o one king james's works folio three three six the laws regarded not their religious opinions but their practices Will any papist assert that the priests and others did not endeavour to compass the death of Elizabeth and to exclude King James from the throne? It is remarked by Sir Edward Coke in the address to the jury that during the year and four months since James's accession no penalty had been inflicted on any recusant. The conspirators could not therefore allege that they were driven to such a desperate course by the harsh treatment which they had received. The plea of religion was, however, urged by these men and that plea was especially grounded on the laws which had been enacted in the late reign against recusants they appeared to exult in the fact that the place in which the unjust laws as they termed them had been framed would be the scene of vengeance when the attorney-general had finished his address to the jury the confessions of the conspirators were read and acknowledged by the parties it was proved on the trial that hammond a jesuit after the discovery of the treason actually gave the conspirators absolution on thursday november the seventh this act is conclusive as to the part taken by the jesuits in the plot a verdict of guilty was returned against the whole number who were arraigned at the bar they were asked in the usual form why sentence of death should not be pronounced thomas winter merely desired that his brother might be spared because he was implicated in the treason by his persuasion fawkes objected to certain parts of the indictment of which he said he was ignorant when he was told that they were inserted as a matter of form bates supplicated for mercy and did not deny his guilt robert winter pursued the same course grant after remaining silent some time confessed that he was guilty of a conspiracy intended but never executed rookwood at first attempted to justify himself but at last acknowledged his offence admitting that he justly deserved to undergo the penalty of the law still he supplicated for mercy on the ground that he was neither the author of the plot nor an actor in it but merely drawn into it by his affection for catesby at this stage of the business a circumstance was mentioned to the court which had transpired in the prison on friday before the trial commenced robert winter and fawkes were permitted to converse together in their cells the former said that he and catesby had sons and that boys would be men and he hoped that they would avenge the cause they also expressed their sorrow that no one had set forth a defence or justification of the plot sentence was not immediately pronounced but sir everard digby who had been some time in custody was arraigned at the bar on a separate indictment he was charged with being privy to the plot with having taken the oath of secrecy 
and also with open rebellion in the country with the rest of the conspirators subsequent to the discovery he had previously made a confession of his guilt and therefore did not attempt to defend himself before the court as he was preparing to address the court he was informed that he must first plead either guilty or not guilty he immediately confessed that he was guilty of the treason charged against him in the indictment sir everard digby evidently would not have been implicated in this conspiracy but for his zeal in behalf of the church of rome so strong was his attachment to the papal creed that he appears to have imagined that he should do god's service by concurring with others in the destruction of heretics having pleaded guilty to the charge of treason he addressed the court respecting the motives that had induced him to enter upon such a course he declared that neither ambition nor discontent induced him to unite with the other conspirators but affection for catesby the leader he also confessed that he was influenced in his decision by religious considerations perceiving as he said that religion was in danger he had resolved to hazard his property and even his life to preserve it and to restore romanism in this country it appears that the romanists were apprehensive of more severe laws being enacted under king james than those which had been carried by the late queen there was no ground for such an apprehension since king james was really anxious to treat his roman catholic subjects with great lenity sir everard also requested that his wife and children might not suffer on his account his last request was that he might be put to death by being beheaded and not as an ordinary traitor the attorney-general replied to his address in a strain not unusual in that age but which would not be adopted in the present day against the greatest criminal alluding to his very natural plea for his wife and children coke reminded him in an insulting and sneering tone of his attempt to kill the king and queen with the nobility of the country asking where his piety and affection were when this scheme was devised when coke charged him with justifying the fact he denied the charge confessing that he deserved to suffer but that he was a petitioner for his majesty's mercy the attorney-general replied that having abandoned every principle of religion and honour he could not expect to receive any favour from his majesty the earl of northampton also addressed the prisoner and in a strain somewhat milder than coke it would shock the feelings of the present age were the judge on the bench to revile the criminal at the bar however notorious his guilt but at that time such a practice was common the earl of northampton told him that he had only himself and his evil counsellors to thank he also reminded him of his favour with queen elizabeth and that king james was not ill-disposed either towards him or the members of his church generally judgment was now demanded by the king's sergeant on the seven prisoners mentioned in the first indictment on the verdict of the jury and on sir everard digby on his own confession the lord chief justice proceeded to pronounce judgment he first took a review of the laws which had been enacted in the reign of elizabeth against recusants priests and the receivers of priests specifying the causes which gave rise to those enactments and demonstrating that they were necessary mild equal moderate and capable of being justified to the whole world sentence was then pronounced in the usual form sir everard digby bowing to the lords who were seated on the bench said if i may but hear any of your lordships say you forgive me i shall go more cheerfully to the gallows the lords instantly replied god forgive you and we do on thursday january the thirtieth sixteen o five to six sir everard digby robert winter john grant and thomas bates were executed at the west end of st paul's church and on friday january thirty first the sentence of the law was carried into effect on thomas winter ambrose rookwood robert keys and guy fawkes in old palace yard westminster at no great distance from the house of lords the scene of their recent treason most of these wretched men evinced much penitence both in prison and on the scaffold it is remarkable that fawkes the most desperate of the whole number appeared to be the most penitent at the time of his execution they all declared their adherence to the church of rome dying as they had lived in her communion they requested that the officers in attendance would communicate this their dying declaration to the world after the execution their bodies being quartered were hung up in various parts of the city as was the custom at that time with those who were put to death for treason the heads of catesby and percy were fixed upon the house of lords 
where they remained some years after when osborne wrote his memoirs of king james unless as he intimates they had been removed and others substituted in their room it was reported when he wrote that the heads then fixed on the house of lords were not those of the two conspirators but the heads of two other individuals procured probably from some churchyard by the friends of catesby and percy and fixed upon the poles for the purpose of preventing the discovery of the theft footnote twenty one osborne's works page four three four james acted with great lenity towards the families of the conspirators by the statute respecting treason the property of the convicted traitor is forfeited to the crown but in the cases of these individuals the children or heirs of those who were in possession of property were permitted to enjoy it there was nothing vindictive in james's character and he would have spared even these conspirators if it had been possible such was the fate of men who appeared to have been guiltless of any other crime and who would not have been implicated in his horrible treason but for the influence of those principles which the church of rome instilled into the minds of her deluded followers End of chapter 6chapter seven of guy fawkes or a complete history of the gunpowder treason a d sixteen o five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg oxnard guy fawkes or a complete history of the gunpowder treason a d sixteen o five by thomas lathbury chapter seven the trial and execution of garnet the jesuit the alleged miracle of the straw is declared a martyr some time elapsed before garnet was taken he concealed himself in various places during the few months immediately subsequent to the discovery of the plot the strictest search however was made rewards were offered for his apprehension and at last he was taken with hall another jesuit and his own servant in the house of a roman catholic the servant became his own executioner in the prison the proclamation against garnet and the other jesuits is dated january fourteenth sixteen o five to six but he was not taken at the end of the month when the other conspirators were executed he did not however long elude the pursuit which was instituted on friday march the twenty sixth sixteen o five to six he was brought to trial at the guildhall in the city of london before the lord mayor several members of the king's council and certain of the judges during his imprisonment he was treated with much leniency as he himself confessed on his trial in the indictment the various names of the prisoners were specified from which document we gather that he was known under different designations according to circumstances wally darcy roberts farmer phillips were the names assumed by garnet on different occasions for the purpose of concealment the indictment charged the prisoner with concurring with catesby and the other conspirators in the plot against the king and the state the jury were sworn and the prisoner pleaded not guilty sir edward coke the attorney-general proceeded to open the case and as this trial reflects much light on the whole conspiracy i shall notice all those parts which appear to me of the most importance the attorney-general stated in the outset that this trial was but a latter act of that dismal tragedy commonly called the powder treason for which several had already suffered the extreme penalty of the law throughout the trial he treated garnet with great respect from sir edward coke's speech we learn that garnet was examined for the first time february the thirteenth and that from that day to the twenty sixth of march when the last examination took place he was examined before the council more than twenty times in speaking of the treason sir edward remarks i will call it the jesuits treason as belonging to them both ex congruo et condigno they were the proprietaries plotters and procurers of it he then enters on a description of some of the treasons which were planned in the reign of queen elizabeth in which also garnet was concerned as i have noticed in a preceding chapter garnet confessed several particulars respecting those transactions in which he had been engaged 
and among other things he admitted that the romanists in england after the bull of excommunication had been issued against the queen were permitted to render her obedience with certain cautions and limitations namely rebus sic stantibus and donec publica bullae executio fieret posset so that while things continued in their present state until such time as the bull could be executed the romanists might obey the queen this was confessed by garnet himself it appears that garnet came over into england in the year fifteen eighty six two years before the sailing of the spanish armada as early as the reign of edward i the bringing in of a bull from rome against any of the king's subjects without permission was adjudged to be treason so that garnet was a traitor by the ancient laws of the land for the bulls against king james were committed to the keeping of that individual the attorney-general had declared when speaking of elizabeth that four years had never passed without a treason and he adds when he speaks of king james and now sithence the coming of great king james there have not passed i will not say four years but not four nay not two months without some treason in these treasons garnet and other jesuits were implicated the bulls which had been sent to garnet before the death of elizabeth and which were intended to prevent the english romanists from receiving any but a popish sovereign were burnt by him as already mentioned when he perceived that king james's accession could not be prevented there would have been danger in preserving them therefore they were committed to the flames the prisoner admitted that he had destroyed them it was shown on the trial that garnet was privy to the plot in various ways though catesby was the only layman with whom he would converse on the subject yet he did not hesitate to confer with his brother jesuits respecting all the particulars greenwell pretended to confess himself to garnet his superior confession is appointed by the church of rome to be performed by the penitent in a kneeling posture but it seems that on this occasion the two parties walked together and during this walk garnet heard all the particulars of the treason how it was to be executed and what was to take place subsequently it was proved also that he had proposed writing to the pope on the subject and that he met catesby and some other of the conspirators in warwickshire it will be seen that he prayed for the success of the great action and it is also a certain fact that all the english romanists prayed for the success of the plot whatever it might be which they knew was in agitation though they were not acquainted with its precise nature on the morning of november the sixth when the plot had failed catesby and some of the other conspirators sent baits to garnet who was then in warwickshire to entreat his assistance in stirring up the people to open rebellion greenwell was at this time with garnet warwickshire was appointed to be the place of meeting after the plot and on this account the jesuits assembled in that county i have mentioned that garnet admitted that he was acquainted with the plot though he pretended that it was revealed to him in confession and that consequently he was not at liberty to reveal it point which i shall notice in a subsequent page the means adopted to procure his confession were curious and perhaps not strictly justifiable a trap was set for the prisoner into which he readily fell for some time he would confess nothing in those days it was customary to extort confessions from prisoners by means of torture a mode long since abolished in this country but the king and his ministers did not wish to render themselves obnoxious to the romanists by resorting to the rack instead therefore of using torture they employed craft and though garnet was an adept in the art of dissimulation yet he was outwitted on this occasion an individual was appointed as the keeper of the prisoner who by pretending to deplore the condition of the romanists in england as well as by complaints against the king and his ministers at length succeeded in inducing garnet to believe that he was well affected to the church of rome two letters were written by garnet and entrusted to this man the one addressed to a lady the other to a priest in the former letter he mentioned what things he had already admitted in his examinations but the second letter was the more important the letter was written on a sheet of paper and appeared to contain matters only of an ordinary kind such as any one might read he had however left a very broad margin which circumstance excited suspicion in the breasts of the council nor were these suspicions without foundation for on examining the letter by holding it to the fire it was found that he had written on the margin with the juice of a lemon 
beseeching his friends to deny the truth of those things which he had already confessed he also expressed his hope that he should escape from the powder plot from want of proof yet he had confessed to the lords of the council that he was guilty it appears however that he did not really expect to escape for in this same letter he applies the words of caiaphas who used them when speaking of the saviour to himself necesse est ut unus homo moriatur pro populo this letter written with his own hand was shown to him at the trial it is still in existence some years ago it was discovered by mr lemon in the state paper office where it is still preserved not only as a proof of garnet's guilt but also as evidence that the principles of the church of rome are not misrepresented by protestant writers the man who had taken charge of these letters conveyed them immediately to the lords of the council the object was to have some public confession of his guilt on his trial they were apprehensive that he might deny even what he had privately stated to the lords which was much less than what he had admitted in these letters the trap which had been set for him by the sage counsellors of his majesty was not set in vain but other evidence was soon produced the individual to whom the letters were entrusted gained his entire confidence garnet told him that he was very anxious to see hall another jesuit known also by the name of old corn who was then confined in the same prison the keeper promised to arrange a meeting between them for this purpose they were so placed that they could converse together while he to avoid suspicion took a position so as to be seen by both at the same time two other individuals were secreted in the prison sufficiently near to hear all that passed between the prisoners they conversed freely respecting their previous confessions and examinations the excuses and evasions which they had prepared and many other matters connected with the plot during the conversation garnet remarked to hall they will charge me with my prayer for the good success of the great action in the beginning of the parliament and with the verses which i added at the end of my prayer he added that in his defence he should state that the success for which he prayed related to the severe laws which he apprehended would during the session be enacted against the romanists the verses alluded to were as follows gentum auferte perfidam credentium de finibus ut christo laudes debitas persolvamos alacrita the next day garnet and hall were examined separately when they were charged with having held a private conference garnet denied the fact in the most decided terms the parties who heard the conversation were then produced nor could garnet object anything against their statements garnet said on his trial that he once thought of revealing the plot but not the conspirators cecil asked who hindered him from making the discovery to whom he replied you yourself for i knew you would have racked this poor body of mine to pieces to make me confess follow remarks on this assertion and in allusion to the interview with hall that never any rack was used on garnet except a wit rack wherewith he was worsted and this cunning archer outshot in his own bow for being in prison with father old corn alias hall they were put into an equivocating room as i may term it which pretended nothing but privacy yet had a reservation of some invisible persons within it ear witnesses to all the passages betwixt them these confessions denials evasions and palliations were defended by garnet under the plea of lawful equivocation a doctrine then at least taught very generally in the church of rome under shelter of this plea the jesuits were prepared not merely to conceal or to deny any fact but also to aver what they knew to be false it was urged and in books too that such a course might be adopted on the ground that the parties reserved in their own minds a secret and private sense thus any question might be eluded and this practice was publicly defended in a treatise licensed by garnet and blackwall certain instances are given in the work as illustrations of the doctrine the following is one of these cases a man arrives at a certain place and is examined on oath at the gate whether he came from london where the plague is supposed to be raging at the time the man knowing that the plague is not in london or that he did no more than pass through that city may swear that he did not come from london it is argued that such an answer would agree with their intention who proposed the question simply with a view to ascertaining whether their own city would be endangered by his entrance 
such was the doctrine of equivocation under the plea of which garnet sheltered himself when he denied many things which were proved against him and which he had himself confessed even sir everard digby resorted to this papal doctrine of equivocation as will be seen from the following extracts from his letters discovered in sixteen seventy five and published by bishop barlow in sixteen seventy nine yesterday i was before mr attorney and my lord chief justice who asked me if i had taken the sacrament to keep secret the plot as others did i said that i had not because i would avoid the question of at whose hands it were i have not as yet acknowledged the knowledge of any priest in particular nor will not do to the hurt of any but myself whatsoever betide me speaking of a particular priest he says in another letter i have not been asked his name which if i had should have been such a one as i knew not of again if i be called to question for the priest i purpose to name him winscombe unless i be advised otherwise and alluding to the same in a subsequent letter you forget to tell me whether winscombe be a fit name i like it for i know none of it in another letter as yet they have not got of me the affirming that i know any priest particularly nor shall ever do to the hurt of any one but myself it is evident that he deemed it lawful to deny anything calculated to bring reproach on his church and that he did not scruple to give a false name on his examination from the manner in which he speaks there can be no doubt that he believed he might lawfully equivocate and from whom had he learned this monstrous doctrine from the church and her authorized teachers the earl of salisbury alluded on the trial to his denial of the conversation with hall reminding him that he was not questioned as to the matter of their conferences but simply as to the fact hall confessed the fact and garnet though he had so strongly denied it then admitted the whole on being reminded of the matter by cecil he replied that when a man is asked a question before a magistrate he is not bound to give an answer quia nemo tenetur prodere se ipsum tresham who died in the tower accused garnet of a previous treason in entering into a league with the king of spain against england before his death he was permitted to see his wife who was aware of his confession respecting garnet under her influence he dictated to his servant being too weak to use a pen himself that he had not seen garnet during the last sixteen years and retracted his previous confession in which he admitted the contrary now it was proved and acknowledged by garnet that they had met several times within the last two years garnet was asked to explain tresham's conduct and his reply was i think he meant to equivocate tresham died within three hours after dictating this letter mrs vaux however confessed that she had seen tresham with garnet at her house three or four times since the accession of king james and that they had dined together with her garnet also publicly acknowledged that he had seen tresham a second confession of mrs vaux's was also read in the court in which she admits that she was with garnet at tresham's house in northamptonshire not long since garnet made a long defence at the bar and on the question of equivocation he defended himself with much subtlety he declared that the church of rome condemned lying but he justified equivocation which he said was to defend the use of certain propositions for a man may be asked of one who hath no authority to interrogate or examine concerning something which belongeth not to his cognizance who asketh as what a man thinketh etc so then no man may equivocate when he ought to tell the truth otherwise he may when he was reminded that he had denied that he had written to tesmond alias greenwell or sent messages to him he said he would not have denied his letters if he had known that the lords had seen them but supposing that they had not been seen he did deny them and that he might lawfully do so this has been confirmed by the papers in the state paper office there is amongst these papers an original letter in garnet's own hand to mrs vaux in which he acknowledged that he was so pressed by the testimony of two witnesses who overheard the conversation between hall and himself that he was at length determined to confess all rather than stand the torture or trial by witnesses garnet endeavoured to shelter himself from the guilt of the plot under the plea that the treason was revealed to him under the seal of confession at first he endeavoured to deny that he was acquainted with any particulars but being forced from this subterfuge he admitted his knowledge 
but contended that he was bound to conceal all that he knew. He acknowledged also that he had concealed the treason with Spain. Only, says he, I must needs confess, I did conceal it after the example of Christ, who commands us, when our brother offends, to reprove him, for if he do amend, we have gained him. With respect to the powder treason, he acknowledged that Greenwell came to him in great perplexity in consequence of what Catesby had intimated. He consented to hear it, provided the fact of his doing so should not be revealed to Catesby or to any other person. Greenwell then revealed the whole plot. He confessed that he was greatly distressed on the subject, and sometimes prayed to God that it should not take effect. On being questioned why he did not reveal the conspiracy, he stated that he might not disclose it to any because it was matter of secret confession, and would endanger the lives of divers men. Cecil said, I pray you, Mr. Garnet, what encouraged Catesby that he might proceed, but your resolving him in the first proposition? What warranted Fawkes, but Catesby's explication of Garnet's arguments? As appears infallibly by Winters's confession, and by Fawkes that they knew the point had been resolved to Mr. Catesby by the best authority. It was evident, therefore, that he did not merely conceal the matter, but that he was an active instigator of the conspiracy. Footnote 22. Mr. Hallam observes, the Catholic writers maintain that he had no knowledge of the conspiracy, except by having heard it in confession. But this rests altogether on his word, and the prevarication of which he has been proved to be guilty, not to mention the damning circumstance that he was taken at Hendlip in concealment, along with the other conspirators, makes it difficult for a candid man to acquit him of a thorough participation in their guilt. Const, Hist, Ibid, 554, stroke 5. With respect to Garnet's knowledge of the conspiracy, it is perfectly clear that the matter was not merely revealed in confession, but that he was one of the actors therein. Nor was the plea of confession consistent with some of his own declarations during his examinations. He admitted that the treason was mentioned to him in the way of consultation, as a thing not yet executed. And moreover, Greenwell did not implicate himself, he merely told of others, and consequently the seal of confession would not have been broken, even if Garnet had revealed the whole to the government. He chose, however, on his trial, to adopt this line of defence, namely that he was not at liberty to disclose anything which was revealed to him in sacramental confession. One of the lords asked him if a man should confess today that he intended to kill the king tomorrow with a dagger, whether he must conceal the matter. Garnet replied that he must conceal it. Parsons, the Jesuit, maintains the same opinion. Speaking of Garnet, he remarks that nothing was proved, but that the prisoner had received only a simple notice of that treason by such a means as he could not utter and reveal again by the laws of Catholic doctrine, that is to say, in confession, and this but a very few days before the discovery, but yet never gave any consent, help, hearkening, approbation, or cooperation to the same, but contrariwise sought to dissuade, dehort, and hinder the designment by all the means he could. He, dying for the bare concealing of that, which, by God's and the Church's ecclesiastical laws, he could not disclose, and giving no consent or cooperation to the treason itself, should have been accounted rather a martyr than a traitor. See an answer to Sir Edward Coke's reports, 4 T.O. 1606. It is remarkable that in a treatise published A.D. 1600, on auricular confession, a case is put to this effect, namely whether if a confederate discover in confession that he or his companions have secretly deposited gunpowder under a particular house, and that the prince will be destroyed unless it is removed, the priest ought to reveal it. The writer replies in the negative, and fortifies his opinion by the authority of a bull of Clement the Eighth against violating the seal of confession. This treatise was published at Louvain. Bishop Kennett remarks on this treaty in his sermon, November 5th, 1715, that it appeared as if the writer had already looked into the cellar and had surveyed the powder and had heard the confessions of the conspirators. The proceedings were at length brought to a close, and judgment was demanded against the prisoner. When the clerk of the Crown asked what he had to say, why judgment should not be given, Garnet replied that he could say nothing 
but referred himself to the mercy of the king and god almighty judgment was pronounced in the usual form that the prisoner should be hanged drawn and quartered on the third of may sixteen o six the prisoner was executed on a scaffold erected at the west end of st paul's churchyard overall dean of st paul's with the dean of winchester exhorted him to make a plain confession to the world of the offence of which he had been convicted garnet desired them not to trouble him as he came prepared to die and was resolved what he should do the recorder asked if he had anything to say to the people before his death reminding him that it was not the time to dissemble and that his treasons were manifest to the world garnet evidently had no wish to address the crowd and without refusing the permission he alleged that his voice was weak his strength exhausted and that the people would be unable to hear him except in the immediate vicinity of the scaffold to those who stood near however he said that the intention was wicked and the fact would have been cruel and that he entirely abhorred it he was reminded that he had confessed his own participation in the plot it was also stated that he had acknowledged under his own hand that greenway had asked him who should be protector and that he had replied that the matter was to be deferred until the blow was actually struck he confessed that he had erred in not revealing all that he knew of the plot but he refused to make any further declaration on the scaffold he kneeled down at the foot of the ladder but so distracted was he during his prayer that he constantly paused and looked about him as if in expectation of a pardon he now expressed his sorrow in dissembling with the lords but justified himself by saying that he was not aware that they were in possession of such proofs against him then exhorting all romanists to abstain from treasonable practices he was launched into eternity garnet was viewed as a martyr by his church after his death yet he had confessed himself guilty when asked by some of the lords on his examination if he approved that the church of rome should one day declare him a martyr he cried martyrem me o qualem martyrem the church of rome could not declare him a martyr however unless they could allege that a miracle had been wrought at his death or subsequent to it a miracle therefore was feigned in order to pave the way into the martyrology this circumstance i will now relate while the body was quartered by the executioner some drops of blood fell upon the straw with which the scaffold was strewed a man of the name of wilkinson who was present was anxious to preserve some relic of the deceased and therefore carried home with him some of the straws sprinkled with garnet's blood these relics were committed to the care of a woman who preserved them under a glass case wilkinson had come over from st omer's on purpose to be present at the execution it was reported that the straws which had been carried away by wilkinson leapt up from the scaffold or from the basket in which the dissevered head was deposited upon his person some weeks after on examining the straws the parties pretended that they discovered a likeness of garnet on one of the husks which contained the grain wilkinson and several other persons asserted that they perceived a likeness the matter was soon noised abroad and the romanists proclaimed that a miracle had been wrought it was thought necessary to institute an examination into the matter and accordingly several witnesses gave their evidence before the archbishop of canterbury some persons had reported that the head on the ear of corn was surrounded with glory or with streaming rays but griffith the husband of the woman who had preserved the straw declared before the archbishop that he discovered nothing of the sort and that the face was no more like garnet's than that of any other man who had a beard another witness deposed that he believed that a good artisan could have drawn a better likeness the matter however was not permitted to be forgotten and at rome a print of the straw was published and publicly exhibited some months afterwards garnet was declared to be a martyr by the pope in which light he is still regarded by romanists the miracle was undoubtedly intended to afford the pope an excuse for his beatification which is the lowest degree of celestial dignity this he did says fuller to qualify the infamy of garnet's death and that the perfume of this new title might outscent the stench of his treason the romanists of that day made the most of this miracle in a work published soon after entitled the true christian catholic it is boldly asserted that the sight of garnet's straw caused at least five hundred persons to embrace the roman catholic faith the miracle was published in all the romanist states 
but in england it was said that the man who had been educated at rome and commissioned to enter into a conspiracy against his native country deserved to be pictured in blood it appears from osborne a contemporary writer that more than one likeness was pretended from his statement it seems that it was circulated that all the husks in the ears on the straws bore similar impressions of garnet's features osborne says that he had had some of these straws in his hand but that he could discover no resemblance to a human face yet says he these no doubt are sold and pass at this day for relics as i know they did twenty years after and he for a holy saint footnote twenty three osborne's works page four three six many false reports were circulated on the continent respecting his death it was said that he evinced much readiness to die whereas he manifested great fear it was also reported that the people interposed and prevented the executioner from quartering him while he was alive but this favour was granted by the command of the king that the crowd nearly destroyed the hangman whereas no violence of any sort was used and that the people were perfectly silent when the head was held up on the scaffold whereas that act was attended with loud acclamations on the contrary the people were with difficulty restrained from taking the law into their own hands and inflicting summary punishment the people also understood that spain and the pope had been plotting with the traitors and so high was their indignation that it was necessary for the spanish ambassador to apply to the government for a guard to protect him from the fury of the populace these reports were intended to divert attention from his crime and from the ignominy of his death that garnet was a traitor against his sovereign and his country cannot be denied by any romanists without resorting to the usual arts and sophistry of the jesuits who contrive to deny anything which it may be inconvenient to acknowledge yet bellarmine has defended him on the ground that the treason was revealed in confession why says he was henry garnet a man incomparable for learning in all kinds and holiness of life put to death but because he would not reveal that which he could not with a safe conscience garnet however as has been shown acknowledged that he ought to have revealed it and besides it was proved on the trial that he was acquainted with the treason by other means than confession he admitted that the plot was revealed to him as they were walking and consequently not under the seal of confession the recently discovered papers in the state paper office confirm all the charges advanced against garnet and the other conspirators at their trial in these documents there is an account of garnet's examination he is asked whether he took greenwell's discovery of the plot to be in confession or not he answered not in confession but by the way of confession it has already been proved that by the ancient laws even it was treason to bring in a bull from rome yet garnet acknowledged that he held three such documents at king james's accession and on his trial he justified himself or rather palliated his offence by stating that he had shown them to very few of his own party when he understood that the king was peaceably put in possession of the throne he committed the bulls to the flames but not till he had ascertained that they could not be executed and that it would be dangerous to retain them lest they should be discovered in the event of his being taken i have already alluded to the mode in which the continuator of st james mackintosh's history of england in lardner's cyclopaedia writes the history of his country another short sentence respecting garnet will show how utterly regardless the writer is of truth in his statements his guilt or innocence is a question of dispute to this day he gives a reference to lingard but the words are not given as a quotation yet garnet acknowledged his guilt and it was clearly proved on the trial thus in a history intended for popular use the guilt of a notorious offender is questioned and the principles of the church of rome indirectly defended the writer further remarks that garnet's admissions were obtained by the most perfidious and cruel acts of the inquisition that conviction under the circumstances of his trial is scarcely a presumption of guilt this is exactly the strain in which romanists are accustomed to speak of the plot in short the writer has written as a romanist and appears to have followed lingard in every particular is such a man qualified to write a history for popular use but to disprove all his assertions on this point i simply quote a passage from the trial which will prove that no cruel means were resorted to in the case of garnet in addressing garnet the earl of salisbury said you do best know that since your apprehension even till this day you have been as christianly 
as courteously and as carefully used as ever man could be of any quality or any profession yea it may truly be said that you have been as well attended for health or otherwise as a nurse child is it true or no said the earl it is most true my lord said garnet i confess it now i ask what dependence can be placed on the continuator of the history in question yet such men are employed in the present day to write books for popular use End of chapter 7chapter eight of guy fawkes or a complete history of the gunpowder treason a d sixteen o five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg oxnard guy fawkes or a complete history of the gunpowder treason a d sixteen o five by thomas lathbury chapter eight the principles on which the conspirators acted in this chapter i purpose to give a short account of those principles on which the conspirators acted and which were regarded by them as those of their church i am ready to allow that many roman catholics deprecated the plot and the course taken by the conspirators but still it is by no means easy to defend the church of rome from the guilt of the transaction since she then entertained principles which appear to justify the attempt of the parties who were implicated in the treason that the jesuits were the life and soul of the conspiracy has already been shown in the narrative they animated the conspirators when they were dispirited warranted the proposed action when they were in doubt and absolved them from its guilt after the discovery nay they pronounced the deed to be meritorious they swore them to secrecy and bound them together to the performance of the treason by means of the sacrament the great wheels therefore by which the whole was set in motion were the jesuits but the arch traitor was the pope himself who had sent his bulls into england to endeavour to prevent the accession of king james for it has been shown that the treason originated in those bulls i shall first briefly state the principles of the church of rome on the question of heresy and heretical sovereigns and secondly examine their practices prior to and at the period in question to show how they corresponded exactly with the principles then publicly avowed and defended it is an acknowledged principle of the church of rome that the decisions of general councils are binding on all there are disputes amongst her divines respecting some of the councils whether they were general or not but concerning the decisions of those councils which have never been disputed there is no question with romanists now some of the undisputed councils enforce doctrines at variance with scripture and destructive not merely of the welfare but of the very existence of protestant states and protestant sovereigns provided the papal see is sufficiently powerful to carry out her principles into action no king was completely master in his own dominions when the papacy was at its height the first council to which i refer the reader is the third council of lateran convened by pope alexander the third a d eleven seventy nine its efforts were directed especially against the albigenses and waldenses who were guilty of no crime except the unpardonable one of opposing the errors of the church of rome twenty-seven canons were framed by this council all of them on matters of trivial importance with the exception of the last which is directed against the poor exiles who were bold enough to prefer their own salvation to a blind submission to the church the twenty-seventh canon imposes a curse on all those who maintained or favoured the waldensian opinions in the event of dying in their alleged errors they were not even to receive christian burial footnote twenty four although ecclesiastical discipline being content with the judgment of the priests does not take sanguinary revenge yet it is assisted by the decree of catholic princes that men may often seek a saving remedy through fear of corporal punishment on this account we decree to subject them the heretics and their defenders to anathema and under pain of anathema we forbid that any receive them into his house or have any dealings with them nor let them receive burial among christians see the original lab at cross tom ten fifteen eighteen to fifteen nineteen 
The fourth council of Lateran was held A.D. 1215. One of its canons, the third, is even more horrible than the preceding. All heretics are excommunicated and delivered over to the secular arm for punishment, while temporal princes are enjoined to extirpate heresy by all means in their power. Footnote 25 we excommunicate and condemn every heresy which exalteth itself against this holy and catholic faith let such persons when condemned be left to the secular powers to be punished in a fitting manner and let the secular powers be admonished and if need be compelled that they should set forth an oath that to the utmost of their power they will strive to exterminate all heretics who shall be denounced by the church but if any temporal lord shall neglect to cleanse his country of this heretical filth, let him be bound by the chain of excommunication. If he shall scorn to make satisfaction, let it be signified to the supreme pontiff that he may declare his vassals to be absolved from their fidelity. Lab et cross, Tom 11, 147 to 149. This canon was also received into the canon law by Gregory the Ninth it was carried into effect against the albigenses this exterminating canon is still unrepealed and may be acted on whenever the church of rome may have the power to enforce it it has been attempted in modern times to deny the genuineness of the third canon but the attempt was unsuccessful it has also been pronounced obsolete it is undoubtedly inoperative simply because the church cannot carry it into execution but it is still the law of the roman church the Council of Constance, A.D. 1415, decided that faith was not to be kept with heretics to the prejudice of the Church, and therefore John Hus was committed to the flames, in violation of the solemn promise of the Emperor. By these councils all heretics are devoted to destruction. They proclaim principles exactly similar to those in which the conspirators acted. In other words, the conspirators acted on the principles promulgated by these councils, as those of the Church of Rome. On these principles did the Jesuits justify the treason and declare the traitors innocent. Attempts are made in modern times to prove that the canons alluded to are not binding on the Church, but the hand of Providence has made the Church of Rome set her seal to her own condemnation in this matter. For by the decrees of the Council of Trent, every papist is pledged to receive the decisions of all general councils. Footnote 26 the Holy Synod decrees and commends that the holy canons and all general councils, and also all constitutions of the Apostolic See, which have been made in favour of ecclesiastical persons and of ecclesiastical liberty, and against the infringers of it, all of which it revives by this present decree, be exactly observed by all as they ought to be. Council of Trent, Session 25, De Ref, Canon 20 it is observable too that emperors and kings are commanded to observe these canons this is surely a revival of the lateran canon the only question therefore to be decided is this namely whether these councils are regarded as general by the church of rome respecting the third and fourth lateran councils there never was any doubt and the creed of pope pius the fourth as well as the council of trent expressly enjoins the reception of the decrees of all general councils footnote twenty seven the creed is most explicit on this subject i do undoubtedly receive and profess all other things which have been delivered defined and declared by the sacred canons and ecumenical councils and especially by the holy synod of trent and all other things contrary thereto and all heresies condemned rejected and anathematized by the church i do likewise condemn reject and anathematize it is very remarkable, nay, I may say providential, that the Fourth Lateran Council is especially alluded to by the Council of Trent. One of the decisions of this very council is specified and renewed by the Trent decrees. The Church of Rome has declared, therefore, by her last council, a council too by which all her doctrines were unalterably fixed, that the Lateran Council is to be received by all her members, and as if to prevent all cavil on the subject, and also to prevent any Romanist from saying that this council was not a general one, and consequently not binding on the church, the Council of Trent has expressly designated it a general council. And still further, as if to remove all doubt on the subject, the Council of Trent has particularly specified one of the Lateran decrees by quoting the first two words. 
the language of the council is remarkable all other decrees made by julius the third as also the constitution of pope innocent the third in a general council which commences qualite et quando which this holy synod renews shall be observed by all footnote twenty eight council of trent session twenty four chapter five it is therefore vain for any papist to pretend in the face of such authority that there is a doubt whether the lateran was a general council in all the editions of the councils it is so designated it is found in the list of councils appended to the editions of the canon law and in the canon law itself it is thus reckoned it is recognized by the council of constance and last though not least by the council of trent itself two things are here to be noted first the council held under innocent the third is expressly termed a general council and this council was the fourth lateran secondly a particular canon of the council is specified and renewed so that no doubt can possibly exist as to the particular council to which the reference is made it is not possible to establish any point with greater precision than this that the charge of holding persecuting and exterminating doctrines is fastened upon the church of rome by these decrees of the council of trent the reader will also perceive that the council of trent revives and confirms all the constitutions of the apostolic see that is all the determinations of the canon law it would be easy to justify persecution and death from innumerable portions of the canon law and how can any romanist allege that the canon law is not binding when it is expressly confirmed by the council of trent it includes all the bulls and decrees of the popes none of the persecuting decrees have been repealed and until the church of rome renounces them by a solemn and public act she will be obnoxious to the charge of maintaining the duty of persecuting heretics none of the laws respecting heresy have ever been relaxed no sovereign was ever censured for punishing heretics no council has ever relieved the papal sovereigns from the execution of the laws to which i have alluded nor was any one ever condemned by the head of the church for putting protestants to death until therefore rome repeals her exterminating decrees she must submit to the heavy charge of maintaining the right to persecute men for their religious belief it is well known that the bull in cena domini is read in the hearing of the pope every monday thursday by that bull all protestants are excommunicated and anathematized and will any one say that the church of rome would not execute the sentence of excommunication if she possessed the power to assert the contrary assuredly argues either great obstinacy or egregious folly to the bull in cena domini may be added the oath to the pope taken by every bishop on his elevation to the episcopal dignity by which he engages to persecute and attack heretics such are the principles of the romish church as embodied in her councils and her canon law if they are true then the gunpowder conspirators were justified in their proceedings nay they were acting a meritorious part in the prosecution of that design nor have the doctors and eminent supporters of that church hesitated to avow the same principles in days that are past though in modern times it has been attempted to deny them or explain them away how modern romanists can consistently deny that such doctrines are enjoined by their church appears to me inexplicable except on the jesuitical principle of equivocation which will enable them to pursue any course calculated to advance the interests of the apostolic see and though romanists generally repudiate such doctrines yet it is asserted in the theology of dens and taught at maynooth and doubtless in other similar institutions that heretics are the subjects of the church of rome footnote twenty nine dens two two eight eight reifenstuhl quotes the third canon of the fourth lateran no less than eighteen times in one chapter and he declares that impenitent heretics are to be put to death this work is a class book at maynooth a host of writers might be alleged who assert that it is lawful to punish heretics with death so numerous are the passages in romish authors on this topic and so well known that i abstain from any quotations still i will meet an objection not unfrequently alleged by romanists when pressed in an argument by the authority of names in high repute in their church namely that the church is not bound by the views of particular individuals the views of these individuals however are those of the church as i have already proved 
but further why are not these views censured if the church does not maintain them the church of rome has published an index prohibitorum in which all protestant works are included and an index expurgatorius in which many passages in the works of well-known romanists are marked for erasure as containing sentiment akin to those of the protestant churches as therefore the church of rome has not hesitated to expunge passages from the writings of her own members when she has deemed them at variance with her principles why if she views those portions of the works to which i allude and which enforce the persecution of heretics even to death to be erroneous does she not adopt the same process respecting them as she has not done so the undoubted inference is that these writings are not disapproved of by the church it is not possible for any romanist to object to this line of argument nor can it be charged with unfairness nearly allied to the punishment of heresy is the question of the pope's deposing power it is asserted in the canons already quoted and which cannot be disputed and it is also asserted by numerous writers whose works have never been censured in an index expurgatorius bellamine says it is agreed upon amongst all that the pope may lawfully depose heretical princes and free their subjects from yielding obedience to them can it be denied therefore that such was the doctrine of the church of rome in the time of bellamine and if such was the doctrine of that church then it must be the doctrine of the same church now since none of her articles of faith have been changed none of her doctrines have been repudiated it is true that the doctrine is not insisted on by modern romanists but what security have we that the claim would not be revived if the church of rome should ever possess sufficient power to enforce it we must therefore insist on charging these and similar doctrines on the church of rome until she renounces them by a solemn and public decision tillotson's observations on this question in his sermon on the fifth of november are so just that i shall make no apology for quoting them indeed this doctrine hath not been at all times alike frankly and openly avowed but it is undoubtedly theirs and hath frequently been put in execution though they have not thought it is so convenient at all times to make profession of it it is a certain kind of engine which is to be screwed up or let down as occasion serves and is commonly kept like goliah's sword in the sanctuary behind the ephod but yet so that the high priest can lend it out upon an extraordinary occasion and for practices consonant to these doctrines i shall go no further than the horrid and bloody design of this day it is singular that there is no express mention of the deposing power in the council of trent the pope and the fathers perceived that times were already altered that sovereigns were not likely to submit tamely to such an assumption of authority and that their proceedings must be managed with more craft than formerly still the deposing power was established by implication in the ratification of the decrees of the lateran council and we know that it was exercised at a subsequent period against queen elizabeth parsons declared in the reign of queen elizabeth that it was the doctrine of all learned men and agreeable to the apostolic injunctions and that the power of deposing kings has not only been claimed but acted upon may easily be proved it was not always treated as a speculative doctrine history shows that many wars have been waged through this very principle in some cases the papal sentence has been carried into effect and in others it has led to war and bloodshed some states having always been ready to attempt to carry the sentence into effect the following list will show how frequently the roman pontiffs in the days of their glory claimed and exercised the power of deposing sovereigns a d ten seventy five gregory the seventh deposed henry the fourth the emperor ten eighty eight urban the second deposed philip king of france eleven fifty four adrian the fourth deposed william king of sicily eleven ninety eight innocent the third deposed the emperor philip and king john of england twelve twenty seven gregory the ninth deposed the emperor frederick the second twelve forty two innocent the fourth deposed the emperor twelve sixty one urban the fourth deposed mumfred king of sicily twelve seventy seven nicholas the third deposed charles king of sicily twelve eighty one martin the fourth deposed peter of aragon twelve eighty four boniface the eighth deprived philip the fair footnote thirty this pope in his bull says 
we declare and pronounce it as necessary to salvation that all mankind be subject to the roman pontiff this bull is a part of the canon law 1305 clement v deposed the emperor henry v 1316 john the twenty second deprived the emperor lodovic 1409 alexander v deposed the king of naples 1538 paul the third deprived henry the eighth of england 1570 pius v deprived queen elizabeth as did also some of his successors this is a sample of papal attempts against kings and it proves that the popes have always lost sight of st peter's character though acting as his successors our own sovereigns have often felt the weight of the papal power king edward was enjoined by dunstan the abbot of glastonbury not to wear his crown for seven years to which he was compelled to submit henry the second was forced to walk barefooted three miles to visit becket's shrine and there to receive fourscore lashes from the monk on his bare back king john was compelled to resign his crown to the pope's legate and take it back on condition of paying a yearly sum of a thousand marks to the pope the pages of history are pregnant with proofs that from the period of the reformation down to the time when the papacy became shorn of much of its strength the practices of the church have exactly corresponded with the principles asserted in the canons already specified in the canon law and in the works of their eminent writers i have alluded to the bulls issued against elizabeth and to the attempted nations and of individuals to enforce them elizabeth escaped but several continental sovereigns fell a sacrifice to the fury of the church of rome henry the third of france was murdered in fifteen eighty nine by a dominican friar who was encouraged to the commission of the act by the prior of his convent henry was a member of the church of rome but he was not so zealous as the pope wished in executing the laws against heretics on account therefore of his supposed want of zeal he was devoted to destruction by the church the deed was lauded in sermons and in books throughout the french territories while the murderer who was destroyed on the spot was deemed a martyr in the cause of the church at rome the fact was applauded by the pope in a set speech to the cardinals the act was contrasted by his holiness with those of eleazar and judith and the palm was given to the friar nay it was compared in greatness to the incarnation of our lord jesus christ i give the following extract from this most blasphemous speech considering seriously with myself and applying myself to these things which are now come to pass i may use the words of the prophet habakkuk behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvellously for i will work a work in your days which you will not believe though it be told you Ebed five the french king is slain by the hands of a friar for unto this it may be compared though the prophet spake of our lord's incarnation this is a memorable and almost incredible thing not accomplished without the particular providence of god a friar has killed a king that the king is dead is credible but that he is killed in such a manner is hardly credible even as we assert that christ is born of a woman but if we add of a virgin then according to human reason we cannot assent to it this great work is to be ascribed to a particular providence in this strain did the head of the roman church laud the murder of henry the third of france the deed was reckoned by his holiness as glorious a work as the incarnation of the saviour and his resurrection from the dead surely the principles and practices of the church were in exact correspondence at that time the principles have never been relinquished and circumstances control the actions of the church so that she cannot kill and slay with impunity henry the fourth of france also fell a sacrifice to the same principles he had been an advocate of protestant doctrines but from motives of human policy he united himself with the church of rome still as he did not persecute his protestant subjects the sincerity of his conversion was called in question by the church in less than one month after his public profession of the papal faith an attempt was made on his life by an assassin who had been encouraged by the reasonings of certain friars and jesuits after several escapes he was stabbed in the street by a man who had formerly been a monk his death was not celebrated publicly by the pope as was that of henry the third but the jesuits and the friars justified the act and proved that on the principle of the church it was lawful to put him to death though a romanist 
since he was not zealous against heresy and in the cause of the papal see king henry had also communicated secret information to cecil prior to the discovery of the gunpowder treason respecting the machinations of the jesuits and seminary priests the particulars of their treason were unknown but the very fact that the french monarch should convey intelligence to king james was a deadly crime in the eyes of the jesuits it was supposed at the time and nothing has since transpired to lead to a different conclusion that the party acted in communicating information to the english court hastened his tragical end i have remarked that the pope did not publicly applaud the act of the assassin but it is a fact that his memory was in consequence held in great veneration at rome for a considerable period after the event henry was supposed to be lukewarm in the cause and therefore it was determined to remove him out of the way the assassins of both these monarchs acknowledged that they were prompted to commit the murders by the instigation of two jesuits and the reading of the works of a third the massacre of saint bartholomew is too well known to need the recital of its horrid particulars i allude to it merely to show how the principles and practices of the church of rome correspond whenever she has the power to act the deed was applauded at rome by the head of the church the crime was consecrated by the pope who went in grand procession to church to return thanks to god for so great a blessing as the destruction of the heretics it appears that the tidings of the massacre reached rome on the sixth of september fifteen seventy two the consistory of cardinals was immediately assembled when the letter from the papal legate containing the particulars of the massacre was read it was immediately determined to repair to the church of st mark where their solemn thanks were offered up to god for this great blessing two days after the pope and cardinals went in procession to the church of minerva where the high mass was celebrated the pope also granted a jubilee to all christendom and one reason assigned was that they should thank god for the slaughter of the enemies of the church lately executed in france two days later the cardinal of lorraine headed another great procession of cardinals clergy and ambassadors to the chapel of st louis where he himself celebrated mass in the name of the king of france the cardinal thanked the pope and the cardinals for the aid they had afforded his majesty by their counsels and prayers of which he had experienced the happy effects on his own part and on the part of the church the pope sent a legate to thank the king for his zeal in the extirpation of the heretics and to beseech him to persevere in the great and holy work the legate in passing through france gave a plenary absolution to all who had been actors in the massacre on the evening of the day in which the news arrived at rome the guns were fired from the castle of st angelo and the same rejoicings were practised as were common on receiving the intelligence of an important victory the pope looked upon the massacre as one of the greatest felicities which could have happened at the beginning of his papacy in addition to these public rejoicings on the part of the pope and his cardinals at rome other means were adopted to indicate the sense of the church on the massacre medals were struck to commemorate the event on the one side was a representation of the slaughter an angel cutting down the heretics and on the other the head of the pope gregory the thirteenth on these medals was this inscription ugnotorum strages 1572 the slaughter was also deemed worthy of being commemorated on tapestry which was placed in the pope's chapel in the paintings which were executed the slaughter of the huguenots was depicted Coligni et sociorum cades and in another part rex Coligni sedum probat let it be remembered that the principles of the church of rome are unchanged and as the romanists themselves aver unchangeable the circumstances of europe are widely different from what they were in the sixteenth century and romanists themselves are under the restraint of wholesome laws and public opinion but were the popes of modern days to be supported by sovereigns like charles the ninth of france or were they possessed of the same power as was once enjoyed by their predecessors is it reasonable to suppose that the principles which are still retained would not be carried out into practice or that the same scenes which then disgraced the civilized world would not again be enacted in every country in which the jesuits and other active emissaries of the papacy could obtain a footing is it not clear from the preceding facts that the murderers of henry the third and fourth and the actors in the massacre of saint bartholomew 
considered that they were acting a meritorious part they were taught that the pope could depose kings and grant their kingdoms to others and they knew that the pope had often exercised that power the gunpowder conspirators were men of the same class and influenced by the same views knowing that all heretics are annually excommunicated they believed that they were authorized to carry the sentence into effect and having been taught that heretical princes might lawfully be deposed they considered themselves at liberty to attempt their destruction the assassins of the french monarchs and the gunpowder traitors being encouraged by the authority of the church as explained by their spiritual directors entered upon their deeds of darkness with an assurance that they were merely obeying the commands of their ghostly fathers the pope endeavoured to clear himself from the guilt of being privy to the gunpowder treason yet some of the planners and contrivers of the plot were protected at rome had his holiness been sincere in his professions to king james he would have delivered up those jesuits who were implicated in the treason and who escaped to rome the surrender of the conspirators would have been the strongest proof of his sincerity but not only did he not give them up to the sovereign whose life they had sought he did not even call them to account for the part which they had taken in the conspiracy i would not charge the guilt of that conspiracy on the members of the church of rome indiscriminately for there were many who were horror-struck at the deed and there always have been many who did not receive all the principles maintained by the church but i contend that the head of the church the pope of that day approved of the act or he would never have adopted the course which he then pursued and in his guilt all the leading members of the conclave were also implicated we can only judge of men by their actions which if they mean anything certainly involve the church of rome of that period in the guilt of the treason garnet was regarded as a martyr not as a traitor and the absurd miracle of the straw was sanctioned at rome these facts certainly involve the then church of rome in the treason and as her principles are unchanged there would be no security against the same practices were circumstances to favour her ascendancy footnote thirty one hallam remarks there seems indeed some ground for suspicion that the nuncio at brussels was privy to the conspiracy though this ought not to be asserted as an historical fact const hist i five five four it is also worthy of remark that the jesuits who were privy to the design and who escaped from the knife of the executioner never expressed the least remorse for the part they had taken on the contrary they never failed to speak of the treason as a glorious and meritorious deed when hall the jesuit alias oldcorn was reminded of the ill success of the treason as a proof that it was displeasing to god he immediately replied that the justice of the cause must not be determined by the event for that the eleven tribes were commanded by god himself to fight against benjamin and were twice overthrown and that lewis of france was conquered by the turks by reminding some of his dispirited companions of many glorious enterprises which had failed in the first instance he hoped to encourage them to persevere and to induce them to expect that god would in the end enable them to accomplish their purposes who can deny after these facts that the church of rome was deeply involved in the gunpowder treason or who can exculpate her even at present from the charge of maintaining principles subversive of christian liberty and protestant governments when one of the conspirators who was received by the governor of calais was condoled with on being banished his country he replied it is the least part of our grief that we are banished our native country this doth truly and heartily grieve us that we could not bring so generous and wholesome a design to perfection sir everard digby was a mild and amiable man and with the exception of his participation in the plot no stain rests upon his character yet he seems to have considered that by engaging in this treason he was really doing god's service his letters written during his imprisonment and published by bishop barlow in sixteen seventy nine illustrate the influence of the principles of the church of rome on the mind of an otherwise excellent individual they were written with a juice of lemon or something of the same kind written too when he had time to reflect in his solitary cell yet it is evident that he thought he was advancing the cause of true religion in the part which he took and further that he was never convinced that the deed was sinful so completely had the jesuitical principles of the prime actors in the conspiracy warped his judgment and influenced his views 
the papers were discovered in the house of charles cornwallis esq who was the executor of sir kenelm digby the son and heir of sir everard they were once in the possession of archbishop tillotson as he testifies in one of his sermons the letters were by some secret means conveyed to his lady and were preserved in the family as sacred relics sir everard digby says archbishop tillotson in his sermon on the fifth of november whose very original papers and letters are now in my hands after he was in prison and knew he must suffer calls it the best cause and was extremely troubled to hear it censured by catholics and priests contrary to his expectations for a great sin the letters were also once in the possession of bishop burnet as he himself informs us from him we learn how they were discovered the family being ruined upon the death of sir kenham's son when the executors were looking out for writings to make out the title of the estates they were to sell they were directed by an old servant to a cupboard that was very artificially hid in which some papers lay that she had observed sir kenham was oft reading they looking into it found a velvet bag within which there were two other silk bags so carefully were those relics kept and there was within these a collection of all the letters that sir everard writ during his imprisonment a few extracts will show what his sentiments were concerning the plot now for my intention let me tell you that if i had thought there had been the least sin in the plot i would not have been of it for all the world and no other cause drew me to hazard my fortune and life but zeal to god's religion for my keeping it secret it was caused by certain belief that those which were best able to judge of the lawfulness of it had been acquainted with it and given way unto it now let me tell you what a grief it hath been to me to hear that so much condemned which i did believe would have been otherwise thought on by catholics oh how full of joy should i die if i could do anything for the cause which i love more than my life on the proceedings which were then to have been adopted in the event of the success of the plot sir everard remarks there was also a course taken to have given present notice to all princes and to associate them with an oath answerable to the league in france respecting the pope's concurrence he has the following passage before that i knew anything of the plot i did ask mr farmer what the meaning of the pope's brief was he told me that they were not meaning priests to undertake or procure stirs but yet they would not hinder any neither was it the pope's mind they should that should be undertaken for catholic good i did never utter thus much nor would not but to you and this answer with mr catesby's proceedings with him and me gave me absolute belief that the matter in general was approved though every particular was not known then alluding to the presence of some romanist peers at the opening of the parliament he adds i do not think there would have been three worth saving that should have been lost in another letter he observes i could give unanswerable reasons both for the good that this would have done for the catholic cause and my being from home but i think it now needless and for some respects unfit the last letter is a long one and is addressed to his sons but though he exhorts them to continue in the faith of the church of rome yet he does not express any sorrow for his crime nor does he caution them against being engaged in similar conspiracies it is therefore clear that he viewed the deed as laudable and meritorious even at the close of his career it appears certain that many of the romanists both at home and abroad were aware that some extensive conspiracy was on foot a particular prayer was used it is said by numbers in england for the success of the conspiracy it was couched in the following terms prosper lord their pains that labour in thy cause day and night let heresy vanish like smoke let the memory of it perish with a crack like the ruin and fall of a broken house it would appear that this prayer was framed by one who was privy to the conspiracy nor can it be doubted that it was intended to convey some intimation of the nature of the treason i am aware that no romanist would in the present day justify the deed but the preceding facts prove that the act was applauded and justified at the time by the whole church almost and for a considerable period afterwards to justify the treason now would be to expose the parties who did so to the execration of an indignant public the principles of rome however are exactly what they were when the bulls of the pope were sent to garnet and when the gunpowder treason was planned tillotson forcibly observes 
i would not be understood to charge every particular person who is or hath been in the roman communion with the guilt of those or the like practices but i must charge their doctrines and principles with them i must charge the heads of their church and the prevalent teaching and governing part of it who are usually the contrivers and abettors the executioners and applauders of these cursed designs footnote thirty two tillotson's works twelve m o volume i three four nine it was decided by pope urban the second that it was neither treason nor murder to kill those who were excommunicated by the church so that any treason or murder could be justified on such principles nor has any change been effected in the principles of the church of rome popery says burnet cannot change its nature and cruelty and breach of faith to heretics are as necessary parts of that religion as transubstantiation and the pope's supremacy footnote thirty three burnet's eighteen papers eighty four andrew marvel wittily remarks of the pope's claim he has indeed of late been somewhat more retentive than formerly as to his faculty of disposing of kingdoms the thing not having succeeded well with him in some instances but he lays the same claim still continues the same inclinations and though velvet-headed hath the more itch to be pushing and however in order to any occasion he keeps himself in breath always by cursing one prince or other upon every monday thursday footnote thirty four the growth of popery page nine end of chapter eight